Professor Chris Houghton. Dr. Houghton is working as a professor in marine ecophysiology at the University of Southampton, UK. His research encompasses different levels of biological organization from molecular studies of changes in gene expression to assays of whole organism physiology in crustaceans. He has published more than 22 articles and book chapters in peer-reviewed literature. Um, so before I start, I'd like to uh, thank the organizing committee for inviting me to speak here today. Uh, and as Dr. Shekhar has said, um, I'm very fortunate to be involved in a collaboration with CEBA with a large number of other colleagues, some of which work we will present to you today. So just to give you an overview of my talk, um, the intention really is to start by just giving you uh, an introduction to some recent advances in our understanding of crustacean immunity from detection to pathogen to response to pathogens. Um, really to make the point that host pathogen interactions are complex and that we really need to up our game um, in understanding experimental design and just what we're trying to do with pathogens. Um, but then the realization that actually uh, intervening in disease in aquaculture is, um, I think, several years away, really. So what can we do in the meantime? And then perhaps to take a greater appreciation of trying to understand the pond environment and the influence that might have on shrimp health. So as an overview of the uh, crustacean immune system, this cartoon just summarizes what we currently understand about the receptor and effector arms of the crustacean immune system. So from the detection of pathogens, pathogen-associated molecular patterns, through pattern recognition proteins, interacting with cells to release potent antimicrobial and immune responsive chemicals into the blood system of shrimp and other crustaceans. Um, and so I'm gonna take various aspects of this pathway and just show you some recent advances that people around the world have been identifying. Um, throughout this system. So in recent years, we've uh, really begun to understand the complexity and the specificity of pathogen detection. We have now identified a series of classes of um, pattern recognition um, proteins, lipopolysaccharide beta-glucan binding proteins, lectins, uh, peptidoglycan recognition proteins, all of which have a role to play in identifying non-self within the crustacean body and triggering an immune response. So we have some examples here of um, Phenoponeus indicus, Panaeus indicus, producing immune responses, lectins in white shrimp, and peptidoglycan recognition proteins in tiger shrimp. We also have an appreciation of expanding uh, families of toll-like receptors within crustaceans and toll-like receptor pathways. So this is an example from the Chinese mitten crab showing pathways of MyD88 expression after vi uh, Vibrio infection and downstream of that, uh, immune effector molecules, antimicrobial peptides being stimulated, um, and also potentially some evidence that some of these toll-like receptor pathways have a role to play in viral detection in the Chinese uh, shrimp. And then also, and I think quite excitingly, we have um, evidence that we have hypervariable uh, receptors for bacterial detection, um, such as DSCAM, which has been found in Drosophila, white shrimp, and many crabs, including our European shore crab. Um, and these hypervariable uh, receptors give us potentially really fine specificity in the detection of pathogens and might allow some specific responses, which perhaps previously we've not had a mechanism for. But mostly we're concerned with viruses in aquaculture. And uh, here again, we have a growing appreciation of the receptor pathway, so how viruses interact with host cells, how they bind with host cells and receptor proteins on the surface of different host cells and gain entry through clathrin-mediated uptake or calveoli pits. So we're beginning to understand how bacteria and how viruses gain entry into the crustacean um, body, if you like, body cavity, and start to cause their pathology. At the same time, we know now that we have cell proliferation in response to infection. There's a characteristic degranulation um, and release of cytoactive molecules, and then a proliferation of new blood cells over time. 
and we have identified different pathways of blood cell proliferation between shrimp and, and crabs and crayfish. Um, so we're beginning to understand how the immune system is regenerated, perhaps how we might uh, create memory within a crustacean. And then we can turn our attention to the effector molecules, the antimicrobial molecules that actually produce um, pathogen killing. Um, and there's uh, at least three classes, so crustins, panaidins, and ALFs, which have been identified in shrimp and other crustaceans, but also lysozymes and other molecules as well. And they have a, a variety, a spectrum of activity that's different between different organisms uh, and different bacteria. Uh, and again, a growing body of evidence suggests that there's a whole variety of specific effector molecules out there which have a different activity. And increasingly, we've heard, we've heard this week about omics technologies and some of the work that we've been doing with SIBA um, in this Baconda project is to look at host and virus transcriptional responses. So time course of infection, looking at uh, changes in transcription of host and virus genes between uh, control animals, which are shown in uh, blue, and infected animals, which are shown in red. So identifying uh, gene transcriptional changes in response to infection. And I'll just draw your attention to my postdoc, Luca, who's speaking this afternoon and explain this data in a bit more detail. And then, uh, most recently, perhaps, a growing appreciation of the role of microRNAs as ho uh, crustacean host antiviral mechanisms. And this is just some data from uh, Huang et al. looking at uh, Marsupineus, looking at um, host microRNAs that are expressed in response to white spot syndrome virus infection, and how some of these microRNAs might control host immune responses to virus infection. But even then, it's a two-way process, and we know now that virus microRNAs also are acting at the same time to try and regulate the host immune response to achieve their own aim of replication within the host. And so, the message I'm trying to give you is that we have amazing complexity in this crustacean immune system and in the pathogens that affect crustaceans. And I would suggest that we're really just still scratching the surface of this complexity and trying to understand these interactions. But slowly, we're building uh, models of pathways of how virus microRNAs, how viruses might interact with host immune systems, but also how other factors such as spawning, stress, stress in the environment, might also stimulate some of these pathways to produce changes in the immune system of our cr crustaceans that we're trying to grow in culture. So, a very quick view of some recent advances in crustacean immunity and our understanding of the complexity of crustacean immunity. And I think it's fair to say that it's an exciting and a fast moving field of research. It's a great field to work in. Um, and it has fundamental application to our understanding of how hosts and pathogens interact. But I think it's fair to say that we still aren't in a position where we can control or eradicate disease in shrimp farms. And the complexity that I've suggested, I think, um, challenges us. This complexity of interaction really presents us with significant problems when we're trying to understand host pathogen interactions. And I think there's a need for uh, researchers in the field, so people in this country, people globally, to be really honest and clear about the, the exact design of their experiments, um, the strains of bacteria or viruses that they're using, the strains of the host that they're using, with re full reporting of metadata. I think one of the problems that we have is that when you read publications about things that are reported, it, there's so much information that's not put in the paper. Um, and that makes it a real challenge to reproduce some of this, um, these interesting experimental results. I think we are beginning to uh, be in a position where people are identifying interventions. So we have RNA knockdown, double-stranded RNA treatments, which appear to work in the lab quite nicely. But I think we're still a few years away from actually deploying that kind of technology routinely in the farm setting in a cost-effective way. The problem with some of these interventions is they're very specific to a single disease. Um, and as we've heard today, as we've heard from the farmers, in many instances, um, we're trying to deal with multiple pathogens at the same time. We don't often see the survivors, so it's very difficult to understand why a particular organism might survive infection. And quite often, those survivors are the most important ones that we need to access to understand why they survive. 
So there's many issues associated with us making advances in this field of application, direct application to aquaculture. Moreover, as we've heard this morning and throughout this week, we have a whole range of pathogens in the pond and other microorganisms in the pond. Our crop species, our shrimp, are not just facing one pathogen at a time. Uh, and we have emerging pathogens that are occurring all the time. Similarly, we have co-infection. So again, as I say, we're not just, our, our shrimp don't just face one pathogen at a time. So perhaps to try and reduce treatments down to one pathogen at a time is not the right way to think about this problem. You know, we might eradicate one pathogen only for a new one to come along. So that presents us with a challenge as well. We've also heard this week about climate change. And I think in the future, we might expect more emerging diseases to become more common as our environment and our pond environment changes. So I would suggest to you, I would argue that um, in the short term at least, I think we need to develop a more holistic understanding of the pond environment and how we can maintain the health of the shrimp to better prepare them for the environment in which they grow without focusing necessarily on tackling one pathogen at a time. And I was really encouraged, actually, by the farmers' conclave in day one. I think you have farmers in this country that really appreciate the need to keep their shrimp healthy. And for me, that's great. That, you know, the understanding that actually it's about maintaining a healthy shrimp gets you a long way to a healthy crop and a successful crop, rather than I can throw these compounds into my uh, pond to prevent disease. I think it's more about maintaining health. So we've seen this idea before today, um, and it's not a new idea, it's been around since the 70s, about the host pathogen and environment, what we call triumvirate or triad. So the interaction of a host and a pathogen in a permissive environment, in the right environment to cause disease, and understanding how that system works in a pond environment, in ponds such as you have in India, semi-intensive ponds, and also in more extensive ponds such as we see in Bangladesh. And we already know, we have good evidence that environmental factors can control the health of our shrimp and can control the immune performance and infection outcome of some of our organisms. So this is just some data from the Chinese shrimp infected with white spot syndrome virus, which shows quite nicely that at different temperatures, you have a different rate of mortality. And so this is evidence that the environment has some control over what that virus and that host are doing at the same time. And there's other examples here listed as well. So it's not just a single study. There's lots of good evidence now for the role of temperature. We have evidence that salinity can regulate the uh, outcome of infection. So again, data from the Chinese shrimp infected with white spot syndrome virus, data showing us that salinity can control the rate of mortality and other examples as well. Um, so it's not a, a single example of this. And we can go on and on with this idea. So this is data of bacterial infection, and again, virus infection in white shrimp. And this shows that um, as the stocking density increases, so effectively you're putting an oxygen demand on the system, as you deplete oxygen from that system, the rate of mortality increases after infection. So again, if we can create an environment in which we have a good oxygen content, the right temperature profile, the right salinity profile, we can go a long way to reduce some of these problems of infection, I think. And I think the farmers appreciate that, at least the farmers we've heard speaking this week. They really appreciate the, the need to regulate and look after the pond environment, and I think that's hugely important. But I, Showing you one example at a time of one environmental condition at a time, I understand is, is, is naive, it's simplistic, and there is data that shows us that actually the interaction of environmental variables is complex. So infectious myonecrosis virus in the white shrimp, um, FIT, these are the control animals just infe fed infected meat. If they see alkalinity stress, F FITA, there's not much change in the rate of mortality. If they see temperature stress, FITS, the rate of mortality, the proportion of infected individuals is very much increased. But if they see temperature and salinity stress, so FITES, the rate of mortality is reduced. So it's, it's not as simple as 
a particular temperature, a particular salinity, we have to appreciate that it's a complex interaction of these factors. So it's not easy, and our farmers face a great challenge with trying to regulate disease. And we should be aware, and you all are aware, I'm quite sure, that obviously experimental studies conducted in a lab are all nice and, and uh, produce nice data sets, but the pond environment is very much more complex. So again, working with CEBRA as part of this project, we've been looking at how the pond condition e evolves during culture. So we have conditions in culture that change gradually over time. Dissolved oxygen might decrease over time, increasing in ammonia as the shrimp grow over time. We have gradual changes in certain pond parameters. But other pond parameters are quite variable, so temperature fluctuates potentially quite a lot. Salinity might fluctuate quite a lot, say, in the winter crops during the monsoon season. Vibrio counts obviously might fluctuate quite a lot. So I'm not uh, suggesting that maintaining pond conditions is a very easy thing to do, but I think it's something that we should strive to encourage our farmers to do. So really, hopefully, you'll take away from this talk that the, uh, as we know more about our interaction of our crustaceans with our, ho our pathogens, it's the complexity of this interaction that will remain a challenge and they will prevent us really eradicating disease in the ponds. However, there is already an appreciation and something that we should really work on about the important role of maintaining the pond environment to maintain the immune system and maintain a healthy shrimp to produce a healthy crop. And really to appreciate and to spend more time and energy appreciating the strong control of the environment in maintaining crop performance and maintaining and managing shrimp health and I think there's a case to be made to do more than we do already. I think through improved regular monitoring, so some of the farmers we heard on, on the first day of the conclave, they regular, regularly monitor their ponds, but I know not all farmers do that. So with improved pond monitoring, improved pond management, but also perhaps improved forecasting to help farmers understand what the changing environment might be in the next few weeks, might help to reduce disease outbreaks in ponds. So we've heard already that CEBA have launched a Baname Shrimp app, and I'm pleased that through our project, we're able to support the launch of a Bengali version that will be widely available in Bangladesh. Um, and I also would draw your attention to another project, which has nothing to do with me, um, which I recently came across on the internet, and it's about um, pest ri risk um, information service. So taking weather data, long, medium to long range weather forecasts, and getting that information out to farmers so they understand the likely pest risk that they will face for their crop in their next growing season. And perhaps it's a na naive idea, but I think these kind of ideas, taking weather forecasts, predictive forecasts of environmental conditions and getting that information out to farmers will help them manage their crops into the future. So I'll finish there and uh, just acknowledge all the funders and my colleagues who have been participating in this project. Thank you.